Uh, my name is Clayton, uh, one of the team here at North Point, and uh, today we are continuing on with our, our Shape series, and it's the conclusion of that series. And so we're looking, uh, we've been looking at the acronym of Shape. Shana, do you want to pop the first slide up for us? Thanks. And uh, so this is a recap. Uh, so we start off with S, which is for. Oh, wow. <laughs> I did hear a bit of mumbling. All right, let's try that again. S is for spiritual gifts. Yes, you can do it. I believe in you. All right. H is for heart. Thank you. A is for abilities. P, personality. And today, E, experience. Great. So, so we've been unpacking this as we go along and exploring this idea. And so we've touched on the idea that each of us are given spiritual gifts as followers of Jesus, that we receive spiritual gifts from God, that we also have our own heart and passion that God has given us, that he gives us an opportunity to connect in with others who share those same passions as well, that we have unique abilities. Mel spoke about that, that we have unique abilities that uh, God has given us, natural talents that enable us to engage in our world and share in ministry. And then last week we touched on the fact that we all have this amazing personality. Some of you are unsure if you've got an amazing personality. You do. Uh, And we're shaped differently. We're wired differently. And then today we're looking at the fact that our lives are full of experiences and that God can take those experiences for his purposes, his glory and his benefit. Because that's what life is, isn't it? Life is a series of experiences. We go from one to the other. And that's just kind of how our life unpacks. Today, here at church, is an experience. Some of you are going, I wish there was a better experience, but here we are. We're here. We're sharing this experience together. Driving here was an experience, and all sorts of things in our lives are experiences. That's that's what happens in our lives. And it shapes us. It informs us. And there are all sorts of things that we encounter throughout our lives. And God can take those experiences and he can use those in different ways for his purposes, for his kingdom, and for his glory. So we want to unpack this today. We're going to look at a a number of scriptures as we explore this idea of the experiences that we might encounter going forward. Is that a bit boomy? Yeah? Do you want me to change mics? We got this one tweaked last week, so... We're all right. All right, we'll press on. All right, so if you have your Bibles, uh, our first reading that we're going to look at uh, today comes from uh, the book of Hebrews. And we are looking at Hebrews chapter 4, starting at verse 14. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Well, this is just, in these few verses, there's just a, a whole lot in here. A few things that are, you know, that don't necessarily tie into our specific topic today, but are, are worth unpacking a little bit before we press into our topic today. Because in these couple of verses, there are some profound, rich theological statements that have been made about who God is. So one of the things that we see in this text says that the Son of God, Jesus, became human. That's what we see. He came He became human. And that is a a profound statement about the character and nature of God. That God is not distant from us. That he isn't separate from the lived experience that we have in our lives. But God, through Jesus, has actually come and taken on flesh and lived in this world. And so we have a God who understands the lived experience that we have. And I guess we call that the incarnation, where God, the supreme being, and it's in Philippians 2 that we read that he gave up his divine privileges and came to earth and dwelt amongst us. And so he took on flesh. He understood what it is to be human. And this is a distinct thing about the Christian message, that the God we serve, the God we know, that Jesus, the Son of God, came 
fully God, fully human, and live the experience here on earth. And what we know is that as Jesus lived that, that experience out, that there was so much in it. But that, that I guess the core principle in this, one of the core things we see in this, is the incarnation. It speaks to the fact that we have a God who came and dwelt with humanity. And that's a really profound statement that we need to hold on to. The second one that we see in here is that he was sinless. And that's a really important distinction for us when we think about Jesus, who came, who was fully human, but he never sinned. That means that he never had a wrong word, a wrong action, a wrong thought. And he always acted in accordance with the will of God. Now, some of us will be struggling to get out of church today without having a wrong thought or action or something. You know? The idea of being sinless is kind of really challenging. And so we kind of struggle. Like It's one of the th things that we see in Jesus, that he was sinless. Which actually means that and when we come to the Easter story in a few weeks' time, when we unpack that Easter story, the fact that Jesus was pure is one of the core foundations that makes the Easter story so important. That Jesus, that the sacrifice that Jesus made was only possible because of the fact that he was sinless. That he was able to do for us that we could not do for ourselves. And so what we see in the sacrifice of Jesus at, in the Easter account is where Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, that he was able to come and reconcile all creation back to God again because of who he was. And so it's a really important thing that we need to understand about this two really profound theological statements that we see just in these small verses about who Jesus was. One, that God was incarnate, that he came and dwelt amongst us, that he was fully human, fully God. But even in his humanity, he remained sinless. Really important foundations for us in our Christian faith. But when we think about this idea of experience, that Jesus actually lived the human experience. This is really important for us to, to get our head around as well, because what we see up here is that it gives us confidence to be able to come to Jesus, because he knows what it's like to live the life we have. It says that he faces all, he's faced all the temptations that we have faced, and yet remains sinless. And so we have one who we're able to approach, that when we approach with our challenges, with our struggles and so forth, that he is able to empathise because he understands. Because when we read through the scriptures, what we see is that Jesus, as he lived his life, he had all sorts of experiences. He had the good experiences in his life. He knew what it was like to sit around a table with friends and share food together. How many of you know that experience? Good experiences of sitting down, sharing stories, laughing, joy. We read in the scriptures a few different times that Jesus loved people. You know, there's God's love, but there's also a sense that with Jesus, that he had this intimacy with a few people. We talk about John as one who Jesus loved. And so it's important that we understand that idea that Jesus had these amazing experiences. Ian's coming to fix me by the look of it. Not, not fix me, just. Oh, you muted me. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Murray. All right. Is that better? Excellent. Back to where I was. So the experiences that Jesus had, had joy, he had love for others. He, he knew what it was to be honoured. People praised him when he came into Jerusalem. He had these wonderful experiences throughout his life. But we also know that alongside that, he also experienced the, the difficulties in life as well. He knew what it was like to be alone. He knew betrayal. Those who were closest to him would scatter when he needed them most. He knew pain and suffering. He knew what it was like to be hungry. He understood anger. He was angry. And so when we think about Jesus and we think about the experiences of his life, you know, when we think about our lives, we have one who we can go to, who understands that life is that a mix of the good, the joys, the celebrations, and the challenging, the sadness, the darkness 
the things where we get wounded, the frustrations. And when we get it wrong, he also understands. Because God is all-knowing. And we're told that we can have confidence to go to Jesus. Because he understands us. He isn't a God who sits aloof and then complaining about, wow, why, why do they find it so difficult down there on earth? I don't understand. That's not who we have. We have one who has lived the experience, who we can have confidence to go to and should and invites us into his presence. And so as we think about life experience, we have a God who understands our life experience and calls us to share that journey with him. But our experiences aren't all just about the good and bad. We, there are all sorts of things that we collect in our life, all sorts of experiences that we come across that uh, some are uh, within our church context, some are outside our church context. There are all sorts of ways in which we encounter God. So I want to go to another passage. Uh, this one is in... 1 Samuel 17. This is about David, the shepherd boy. Starting, I'm going to start at verse 32, and this is what it says. So, so David, just a little bit of context. David's brothers have all gone off to the war. David was at home looking after the sheep, and then he's kind of like, he goes to check on his brothers to find out how they're going. And so he gets there, and he sees what's going on, and he's kind of like, I don't understand. Because, you know, They've gone to war, but there's not a lot of war. There's a lot of taunting which is going on. So this is where we pick it up. David says this. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I will go and fight him. Now remember, this is a shepherd boy, a boy coming to Saul. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. That's a great resume, isn't it? Sign me up. When a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from, the mouth, from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I've done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defiled the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the... Claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. So David, as a shepherd boy, was out in the fields looking after the sheep and the goats of his father. And they didn't have lots of fenced properties. It was kind of, you're just out there, wandering around, and all sorts of wild animals would come. And the role of the shepherd was to protect the animals and to go after them and to rescue the animals back. And so this shepherd boy had grown confidence from some of these experiences that he had. And he was like, when he goes to, to this, you know, this battle and all he sees is this giant Philistine coming out and taunting them going, well, come on, send out your best warrior. And everyone else is going, well, we're not sure if we can beat him or not. But David turns up and he's like, of course we can. One, because he's had these experiences of going, well, you know, in the past I've taken on things which are bigger than me and God has been with me then. And if God has been with me then, then God will surely be with me now. And so there was a confidence not only in his abilities to fight, but also a confidence in the ability that God was with him. That God had proven his faithfulness over and over again through the different circumstances he'd found himself in. Now, I'm sure that there were a few times when he came out from fighting a bear or a lion that he had a few scraps and grazes and scratches and so forth. You know, maybe he didn't. Maybe he had that Teflon stuff that you know, no one could harm him. But I'm, I imagine, right? Some of you wrestle with cats at home and you come out scratched up, right? So imagine taking on a lion. So he would have come out with some scars along the way, but that didn't deter him from going but despite that I still came out on top I still did the job that that I was asked to do and so we need to recognize that there are all sorts of experiences that we pick up in our in our lifetime 
that God can take, that can build our confidence and that God can take and use for his glory and his benefit along the way. Because we grow through our experiences, don't we? Uh, this, uh, so I've been in ministry for like uh, 30 years now. And um, I've got to say, without bragging, you're getting the better end of the deal, <laughs> right? After 30 years of ministry, I've looked back and kind of go, I can't believe they let me behind a pulpit when I first started. Some of you are thinking that right now, but anyway, it's a different story. But there are all sorts of things that I've learned through my experiences, the good and the bad. There are all sorts of things we learn through good experience of God's faithfulness, of the things that, that God does, and we trust in God, and we grow in our faith in that way. But we also learn through the difficult. I've made mistakes along the way. I've done things when I look back, well, what was I thinking? I shouldn't have done it. And you learn through all those sorts of things along the way. And they influence who we become in our lives. And they prepare us for the things before us. And so we need to remember that. Now, we, we can think that when it comes to the serve, for serving God, that it's only the things that we do in our church context or our faith context that count. But some of you have picked up amazing skills and experiences through the marketplace. In your workplace, they have trained and equipped you in leadership roles. They've invested in you. They've given you experiences that, can, that God can use for his glory and his benefit. And I've talked to people it's like, oh, no, that's, that's my work stuff and my church stuff and my God stuff is separate. Well, I really challenged that idea because God can use all things for his benefit. And some of you have great skills and have great experience that if you look at the opportunities within the kingdom, there are opportunities for you to use those for God's glory, to fill the kingdom of God. Rather than just going, well, that's my work thing, that's what I do there. And I know some of you might be going, but well, I do IT, what is, how, do I, how does that apply to the kingdom of God? But if you look across the spectrum of what's available out there, every skill base, every experience we get, God will find a way to be able to use for his honour and his glory. Some of it might be here in the local church, some of it might be in international arenas. There are all sorts of ways in which God can take that on. So I want to encourage you as you think about your own experiences, particularly around the way that you know, you're in the marketplace or in the workplace, whatever it's been like, that God has given you some skills that can be used and experiences, the good and the challenging, that you can bring for the sake of the kingdom. That you'll be able to look forward towards what God might be able to do with that. Because it's as we offer what we have to God that we recognise that we are blessed to be a blessing to those around us. And we can make a difference to the people there with us. So that's the, the second scripture. And then the, the third scripture that I want to look at today it comes from Romans. If I can find my... There we go. Romans 8.28. And some of you would be very familiar with this text. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. All of our life experiences that we gather along the way are for the good of God, that God will use those for good. Now, some of those life experiences we have are mountaintop experiences. In the last couple of weeks, our daughter went to a concert and she came home and she described it as the best night of her life. Can you imagine one of those experiences? <laughs> Who's had the best night of their life? Some of you are still waiting for it. Don't be like that. Something has happened in your world where you're going, that was amazing, right? Yes. Yes. And if you're unsure, you need to reflect a little more and go, where is God? What, 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 what are the good things that you've noticed? What are the things we can be grateful for in our world? Where we look at the things in our lives and we kind of go, this is good. And we look at this scripture and it's great to be able to look at that and go, yeah, God can use those. God can encourage us and bless us through those good things. It can energize us and do all sorts of good things for us. And it's easy to look at that scripture and go, God uses these good things when things are going well for his glory and his honor, for the good of those. 
But this is also a complex scripture, isn't it? Because I've had times in my life when I've had to say to God, I'm not sure how this is good. And I'm not sure how this is going to be used for your purposes. Because I feel like crap. And this is rubbish. And yet your word tells me God causes everything, everything, to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. This is a tricky scripture. Because we know that there are times when life sucks. When life doesn't go the way that we planned it, when the things that we hoped for, when the plans that we had go south in a significant way. And we go, how, how does that work together for good? How does that happen? And it's one of the more challenging places we find because there are things in our world where we find it really difficult. And sometimes it takes time to get to a point where you can look back and go, okay, I can see maybe God has done something here that I wasn't anticipating or expecting. And it'd be really challenging at times. Uh, this coming week, Ros and I will celebrate 31 years of being married. I'm not sure how she's lasted. <laughs> that didn't sound very good, did it, how she's lasted? That's terrible. We're celebrating 31 years of marriage this week. Yeah. <laughs> And um, actually, I was talking with uh, Rose Taylor at uh, Russell's uh, funeral this week, and we were reflecting that when, when you intersect people at a certain stage of their life, you, you kind of meet them at that point, and then all the stuff that's happened beforehand is kind of like you, you get glimpses of, but you don't really know. You know so, so Ros and I have been here for three years, and you, know, you get a glimpse of our life through you know, some of the stories I tell and the conversations and the way we meet. And you know, we, we have three great kids. And, you know, we, you might meet us now and you go, wow, you guys are, you know, you've got a great family and we do have a great family. But we had about two and a half years where we thought we weren't going to have children. And it was a really difficult season for us because we were in a church that had a number of young adults, young marrieds, and it seemed like everyone was popping out babies except for us. And we wanted to. We wanted to start our family. And it became a very complex scenario. And, and then some people got onto their second babies. And it was still uncertain for us. And it was really difficult. There were tears, there were all sorts of questions that we had, there was uncertainty. And it was like, we just don't know where, what this is going to look like for us. What does it look like if we, if we never have children? Well, we're grateful that we can reflect back and we, we have three wonderful children and I never take having a family for granted. And I know that we're fortunate because for some people, they are never able to have that experience. But one of the things that we've noticed over the years is that over time, as you're journeying with people and talking with people, sometimes you come across young people, young families who, or couples, and they're struggling with having a family. Because often when you get married, no one tells you that getting pregnant could be more challenging than you, than you expect because often the message is, be careful, right? You know, be careful because you never know, you, you just might get pregnant. And so when it turns out that that's harder than people uh, kind of made out, it can be quite challenging. And so for Ros and I at different times, either with a couple or for me with, with some men and, and Ros for different women, there's been an opportunity to take that journey and just go, well, that's been part of our journey as well. And not always promising the world or that it'll be okay, but to kind of go, we, we know what it's like to sit in a community. And it was, it was very private. It's not like we proclaimed it from the front. So sort I of said, this is, <laughs> this is what's happening for us. It was very private. And so you carry those things. And to, to be able to sit with people and kind of go, yeah, we understand what it's like when your friends are getting pregnant and, and you're not. And you want to, and that can be hard. And so what we've noticed is that over time, and that's just one example of where God takes some of those more challenging moments in our lives and some way turns it around where we're able to have a conversation to support, to journey with, to be present 
with others and encourage them where they're at. Or sometimes just to listen and say we understand. The power of understanding is phenomenal. And some of you, you know, if we took time and just sort of said, you know, what's, what's your story? What's the story that you carry where your, your plans didn't go anywhere near what you thought they would be like? I suspect that the majority of us have those stories. Moments or things, challenges, difficulties, some are more obvious than others, but we carry them with us. And one of the sayings that I've really come to appreciate over the years is, is the one that says that, that God never wastes a hurt. And for me, what that communicates is that God doesn't bring these things into our, into our lives to, to make us better, to challenge us, to grow us. But some of these things are the lived experience of, of living in a fallen world where there is brokenness, where there is sickness, there is disease, there is death. And we experience those things. But God won't waste those opportunities. I think one of the challenges that we face is that often we want to make meaning out of some of those big things. Well, this happened to me, so therefore there must be something big or good that's going to come from it. And maybe the good is potentially one conversation. 30 years later, where you sit with someone and all of a sudden it makes sense. I appreciate it. Joe led Russell Brown's funerals on uh, through the week. Uh, Russell and Margaret were members here for a number of years, uh, now attending at a different church. Um, but Joe just shared a little insight from Russell. Russell was a, a volunteer chaplain at the hospital, and uh, he'd been going through a number of cancer treatments himself. And so when they were talking about what to do, Russell was kind of like, oh, well, I've been through the oncology journey. Let me go to the oncology ward. Russell was able to take his experience and go, I understand what it's like to go through treatment, to have those things, and that would be a good fit for me to be in those conversations. And sometimes those things happen in a context of like a chaplaincy conversation. Other times, they're just with people who you meet, who you become an important listening ear. And so I just want to encourage you that through our lived experiences, that God can take those and in a moment, use them to transform someone else's experience. Or sometimes the good that comes from it is the process of our journey of listening to what the Spirit is saying, deepening our faith, trusting God in the uncertainty, and being open to what God has for us. So as we think about life experiences, we, we think about a God who understands our lived experience. We think about the things that we accumulate through our, all of life, in the marketplace, through our social settings, our hobbies, all sorts of things we collect along the way, and, and God can use those for his glory and his benefit. And then we recognise our own personal, the good and the difficult, that God can turn around And take the journey with us. And this Shape series has really been about you know, how do we connect into the kingdom of God? How do we take all of who we are and apply that to how we can serve one another and be a blessing to our community? That, that's the understanding behind it. That we kind of equip one another for the, the, the things that God has for us. And so this idea that as we understand our gifts and our heart and our abilities, personality experience, we understand who we are. And we find a way in which we connect into where God wants us to be a blessing for others. And over the years, some people have sort of said to me, they said, well, isn't that what we pay the pastors for to, to do this stuff? I've got good news and bad news for you. The good news is that the pastors are here to support and encourage you in your journey. The bad news is that our job is actually to work out how to get you involved. 
Because being a follower of Jesus is not a spectator sport. It's high participation. And when I say high participation, more than just an hour on Sunday. It's finding out how you connect with those around you. It's finding out how your gifts and talents will be used for the glory of God. And some of those will be in the local church context, like we have lots of people we serve here, which is great. And as Mel shared this morning, we can always use more. But it's not limited to here. Some of you will find ministries in amazing places that will be a blessing to the greater church community. And we want to encourage and bless that as well. So... I want to conclude with a, I just want to pray. This morning as I was doing my my final sort of reading over and wondering about what was God saying to us in this, I I sense that as we talk about this idea, because when we talk about uh, that that scripture from Romans 8, 28, for some people that is a, a really difficult scripture because trying to make sense of the current life experience doesn't, doesn't work. And it's not until we are able, I guess, to... What's the word I'm looking for? It's not until we're able to reconcile the events of our lives that they can actually be of benefit to others. So if you're still carrying deep bitterness about something you've experienced, you're not going to be able to minister to someone effectively out of that. You'll share your bitterness if you're still carrying deep woundedness or grief, that will continue to be part of who you are. That's not to say those things aren't valid parts of the journey. But I, as I was sitting and, and praying and, and just wondering where we land today, I, I had a sense that God wanted to do some healing this morning. For those of you who feel that wound is still pretty raw. And so we're just going to take a a little bit of time to pray. And you you know your journey is way better than I do. And so we're just going to take a few moments of silence. And I just want you to, as a sign of openness, perhaps just have your hands open on your lap as a sign of being open to the Spirit of God. And if there's something that you are carrying, something from 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago, where you still hold that resentment. You haven't reconciled it with God yet. But maybe God wants to do something with that today. So would you join with me as we pray? And I just encourage you to just lay your hands out as a sign of being open. Spirit of the living God, Holy Spirit. You're present here with us, but we, we just want to invite you to, to open our, our minds and our hearts that we might notice notice the things that we carry that are not ours to carry. where we carry resentment and bitterness and woundedness. And spirit that you reveal to us what we need to lay down now.
Jesus, we invite you to bring healing and restoration. I've been asking God what are the things, there, there are two, two words that have come to mind and this might be for some of you sitting out there, it may not be, but the two words that come to mind are, are relationship and forgiveness. I, I don't want to unpack that too much because I don't want to get prescriptive but I just wonder whether some of us carry wounds from past relationships. And God is asking us to take that step of forgiveness within that, that we might be set free. Jesus, we continue to ask for your leading, for your grace. I just think of that scripture that says we have a God who understands us, that we can come boldly into your throne room and we will receive mercy we will receive grace. Thank you, God, that you want to be present to us in the good and the difficult. Amen. Thanks, Lisa. As the team come up, I just want to encourage you that if if you want someone to pray with you after service, then we encourage you to do that. Maybe, maybe you've got friends or family here that you can invite pray with. If God has been speaking to you, you kind of go, I need to, I'd like someone to pray with me about that. Uh, our pastors or elders are also available. and We're not going to make a big thing of it. You just come and tap someone on the shoulder. And, Would you pray with me? Uh, our vision is about authentic community and passionate followers and radical love. An authentic community prays for one another. Passionate followers seek to be right with one another. And radical love helps us to be available in the sense of Jesus is available for all of us. Thanks. Thanks.